Hello and welcome to the Lexington class Battlecruiser Com Response video. Now, I have to admit I've recorded actually more versions of this than I normally do for a Com Response video. That's because, honestly, this is a bit of an interesting one to go back to. It's the experience of this one and some of the comments on this and the discussion on this. It's one of the reasons why I don't get involved in the comments in terms of responding to comments quite as freely as I used to. Mainly because it caused me to come aware there's a bit of a problem and I had to try and work it out with the YouTube scenario. That's one of the reasons why I started doing far more Discord streams and Discord chats on Thursday nights, etc. to try and remedy some of that problem. In one of the sections of the comments I'm going to get to in this, someone responds with the line, um, this is be but some along the lines of this is because I'm a biologist. Uh, that I wasn't agreeing with them because they're a biologist and I didn't think they should get involved in the history. There are three small problems at that point. One, as much as I have great respect and great affection in many ways for all the people who watch my videos and who chat and discuss it and talk away with me. I don't know you. I had no idea until that person told me that they were a biologist. I don't presume anyone is or isn't a historian. I don't know anyone who's commenting on this. I don't know who you are. You can use your real name a good example here is Jacob, but it's also Knight6831. I have no idea who Knight6831 is. They could be jumping up and down in front of me in the street, stark naked, and I wouldn't have a focus who they were. I just think there's a naked person jumping up and down uh, in the street. It's blooming cold. I think I'm going to avoid them because obviously, obviously, uh, obviously something weird's going on there. You know, that is what would go through my head. I wouldn't go, oh, that's 96831. I don't know you. And in a way, you don't know me. I find it very interesting, therefore, sometimes some of the comments. And this one, uh, this one got interesting. Because one of the big problems I have, and this is the same problem you have as a marker and all sorts of things, is that you can only respond to what's written down. I don't know what the question you're meaning to ask is in your head. I don't know what the question you're meaning to, you think you want to ask, or you think you've asked. I can only see the question which is written down and what I interpret from it. And I will try and answer that as best I can when I think I'm able to in a comment. I prefer to do videos. I, it's another thing I prefer to do videos because I tend to be able to do a more fulsome response and point to uh, things and therefore deal with them that way. This was not good for me. In that the response is... frustrated me because I didn't feel I was able to communicate as fully as I could do. But I also felt to some extent frustration on their behalf because I didn't think they were communicating what they clearly wanted. And they were responding at points in ways which were rude to my feeling. They might not have felt they were rude, but from my reading of it, it came across as rude. And that is the problem with a form of non-verbal communication, non-visual communication, where you don't get those cues between two people who do not know each other. All sorts of things can be interpreted and misinterpreted. All sorts of statements can be made. The joys of the internet. So, I'm adding this in at the beginning of this common response video to explain what's coming up. There is this discussion. I've re-recorded that a couple of times. I've tried to make sure I'm as polite as I always am. As 
informative as I always am. But I wouldn't be surprised, in whatever version I do, that some sarcasm does enter into it. Because, at my base point, I'm British. Sarcasm is as natural to us as breathing. In fact, honestly, if you asked us to pick, pick between the two, it would be an honest, actual challenge to make that decision. Anyway. Let's start off with that nice before we put up the slides. Uh, so, one thing that we can easily say is how many 18-inch coastal batteries uh, would the British have built if they got the 18-inch 45 caliber Mark I gun to work? Um... Honestly, that's an interesting question. There are certain parts of the UK which they might want to secure. They might want to secure. Uh, Straits of Dover being an obvious one. But also there's Plymouth, Portsmouth, uh, Thames Estuary, Further Forth, those sort of areas. There's also the fact that if you got them to work at that sort of period, they might well be the guns used for Singapore. Maybe even for Gibraltar as well. Because if you can secure those areas of those guns, especially in appropriate turrets, turrets which can have maybe a higher angle of fire, so maybe can achieve 45 degrees or, well, close to that in terms of their angle, so maximum potential range. Yeah, they would have been really quite useful and really quite attractive to the British as a way of securing large areas for the freedom of movement of their supplies. And also to act as force enablers for their own battleships and their own battle fleet. That was the trouble. That was Britain hadn't really pursued a policy of massive fortifications in prior to World War One or even during World War One because they could always rely on moving a large fleet around. They could always require, rely on building more battleships, and ultimately that was far more economically viable for Britain and its empire in terms of security. But saying that. Once you get into a treaty system, even though you can't build certain fortifications in certain places in the world, Britain could have built those fortifications in quite large chunks of its own empire. Now, recently I was asked an interesting question as to whether or not the modern narrative we have of the Royal Navy and various other things in the interwar years being weak and terrible is a narrative which was to an extent built up to support the army's efforts in the Cold War. I wouldn't say it was. I would say, however, that during the Cold War period, there was a lot of emphasis on the army and the army's service and the army's trouble in the interwar period. And I think a lot of that is transposed across to the whole wider forces. It's presumed because the army had the issues they had, that the Navy must have had those issues. Again, one of the interesting things that comes out about is the stuff around the Invergordon mutiny and the, the, the various mutinies that the British, the British had in that sort of that period. There is generally a belief by some that the reason for them was to save money, and actually it's worse than that. It was to make it administratively more easy. They wanted to combine everyone onto the pay scale. And of course, they just thought that everyone except going on to the lowest pay scale because that was the most efficient and organized for them. Honestly, the people who were making those decisions were absolute dullards about personnel and psychology. They really didn't think it through. They just thought, well, we can because this is what we'd have done years ago. It's not the same. 1920s is not the same. The level of education amongst your sailors, the level of communication amongst your sailors, being a naval of, a naval rating, even a sort of, especially a chief or NCO, is a middle class occupation at this point. It's a lower middle class, but it's middle class as we consider it. In that, whilst they ha in terms of the phrase of the time, they have a level of education. They are skilled labour. They are paid for that skill. They earn their pay not because of the hours of work they contribute, but the years of experience they have to contribute in those hours. That makes a difference. And they expect to be paid appropriately. Which is 
a problem for them. It really is. Now, let's go on to the next question, HMS Conqueror. But first, slideshow. Let's make sure that's unpaused. So, the weaker of free battle cruisers after World War I. Americans love to show strength, but this design was an epic fail as a battle cruiser. In the actual fight, even with Congos, imagine if USS Lexington, not USS South Dakota, was in the second naval uh, battle of uh, Guadalcanal. I think the Mer American U battle cruiser probably had fallen a similar fate as HMS Invincible in Jutland. G3 and Margis were superior designs all along. Okay. For starters, the Lexingtons are a battle cruiser, not a battle cruiser. They could have been upgraded, so that has to be considered as a point of view. And also, 16-inch guns are pretty persuasive systems. So, whilst you are, to an extent, correct, they would have probably handled the battle very differently. I think myself, in any scenario where the battle cruisers, the Lexington class, are built, they find themselves being used as reconnaissance, rapid reaction, and carrier task force leaders. I, you'd have a carrier task force set up, and the flagship would be one of the Lexington class. I could see that fitting with a lot of what the Americans wanted from them. And that would also secure the carrier task group from Congos and from other fast Japanese threats, because, let's be honest, whilst the Congo is more of an improved Tiger battle cruiser, one word, not a battle cruiser, two words, like the Lexingtons, I think an entire task group, Lexington leading it to fend off against the Congo attacking a carrier task force, yeah, that, that, that'll work. That will work. Your book is a prize to be a great idea. It's original, special, and personal. Well, that is the plan. The plan is I have got, I think, six copies have been sent to me of the new of the second edition. I plan on keeping one. I've got three. I'm definitely sending out to people as thank yous, which means I have two to put as prizes. I've got to decide what the competition is going to be over Christmas. So, suggestions for that, <laughs> please put them on any video you're watching and just put Christmas uh, Christmas competition suggestions, 2023. And, um, so Christmas competition suggestions, 2023. I'll look for that. I, I can search for that. And, um, yeah, we'll see what we can find. See what we can good. But, again... Don't be harsh on Lexingtons because they're not the Amagis and the G3s. In many ways, it's a reaction to what the Americans are doing. The Americans are building the ultimate battleship, as they can perceive it when they're building that generation in the uh, Dakotas. They are building that. They are building those vessels for that purpose. And as such, it makes sense to go and build something of the other end of the spectrum to complement it. The British are increasingly... Whilst you have a look at sort of the British, why are they building the G3s, which are definitely battlecruiser single word, rather than when they're building the N3s, which are, again, ultimate battleship. Pure battleship completely speed is completely eh, it's something that happens to other people this thing is going to maybe take time to get to you but when it gets to you you're going to be able to do all about it well the reason is look at what the British are planning to do with their G3s I would argue looking at them as battle crews and looking at those designs they are distant they are distant um, distant station ships. They're going to be the cornerstone of an eastern fleet. They're going to be the cornerstone of British forces in the Far East. Therefore, to an extent, they need to be able to stand up against the forces which are most likely to send to hunt them down in initial conflict, which is going to be other battle cruisers. 
So therefore they have to be designed to fight other battle cruisers. And that's when you start getting into interesting points in that, in that sort of scenario. That's what they're designed to fight. The G3s aren't designed to fight battleships. If they do, maybe all the ones they have already have a chance against and with their guns, but honestly, their armor coverage is not enough to do a long term a battle of a battleship. They want to get out of there fast, use their speed to dictate range and keep well away from them. But other battle cruisers, yeah, they're made to duke it out with them. They've got equivalent level of protection, so they're just as equally. Um, how do I put this? Sledgehammers whacking at eggshells, which have a little bit of chainmail on them. It may help, it may not. It may just turn them into a colander. Carlton, so Adrian's hood is much better armoured on paper, yet she still went up with smoke. Okay, she was hit by a more modern gun, but back in the day you couldn't armour against a 16 inch. Even the cancelled soda as South Dakotas weren't. Why bother? Just go for firepower to nuke Congo and speed to run from Margi and all be fine. They'd have made excellent carrier escorts too. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. And I would say Hood starts out as a battle cruiser as well. She starts out. She is the her generation's battle cruiser. And is evolved towards being a battle cruiser, but doesn't reach it. I I would argue doesn't really reach it. They they sort of get there, but really with the um, the remainder of the admiral class, they get them closer to it. But the point is, you are trying to change a ship. You could upgrade a design of a G three to turn it from a battle cruiser into a fast battleship. You can't really turn a battle cruiser into a fast battleship. It it's too many skips in its subdivision in its hull to sort of make up for it. You have to just do too much work. It's it's cheaper, easier, and a lot quicker to build a new ship. I one five four. I just had one huge problem. What if they went the wrong end of a long lance? Fulcrum. Every ship before or since is a huge problem if it meets the wrong end of a long lance. The whole point of the design was to give the IJN Light Forces a weapon that could kill or critically damage battleships from outside secondary battery range. Mm-hmm. I can't. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't these ships as originally designed have boiler rooms above the waterline? Sander Goodall had to basically redesign them. I think I have botched the poor fellow's name. They were half and half. Uh, but yes, Goodall did have an interesting conversation with some of the architects. Goodall was not impressed by some of the people working on them. Um, Remicon, the Congos are really nice looking ships in their original configuration. I don't know. It's a shame, really. Anyway, the Congos are really nice looking ships in their original configuration. Renowns take first place in my eye. I would agree. I do like the Renowns. Battlecruiser Action 1928. It's funny to think how quickly the world changes. If you were talking about naval aviation and carrier firepower in the 1920s, the big killing instrument was the spotter aircraft, really. The torpedo aircraft had not got anywhere near the level of accuracy they would in World War II, let alone the ability to drop as precisely as they did and as survivably for the torpedoes as they did. Dive bombing was being worked on but there was a lot of work needed to develop dive bombs and there's a reason why in World War II some of the dive bombers are literally chucking adapted warship shells at each other at their targets because it does pretty much the same job you just need to modify it So yeah, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, battle cruisers would have dominated. Wasn't a turbo drive oh, no. heavier than the steam turbines with the same power Donald McGon? Yes, but it was more resilient as an engine could, uh, as any engine could drive any shaft, and more efficient as you can always run those engines at the best speed for them. And 
Keys Master adds on. Um, another advantage of was a turbo electric drive allowed for more leeway in arranging the machinery spaces and allowed a narrow layout, which gave room for deeper torpedo defense despite having to fit through the Panama Canal. Colorado class had better torpedo burns than the subsequent trips, which returned to the geared turbines. The electric motors could also go from full forward to full reverse power in seconds, which gave a little bit of extra maneuverability in emergency. Hmm. And as Fulcrum says, the USN wanted more range without increasing bunker space. If you can make engines more efficient, you can increase range. No, no one really likes to look at the cage masks. They do look weird. Decision. Nothing confirms Dr. Al's intention and contention that Balakridzes should have been called frigates more than the mooted names for this class being the name of the original big frigates. Yeah, it, it's one of those things of, I often do think, if instead of Drenor Armoured Cruisers or Battle Cruisers, if Fisher had gone with Frigate as the name for what would become the Battle Cruiser, it would have been a really interesting evolution. It would also have, I think, forced them to be a separate category under the Washington Naval Treaty. Because a lot of the arguments based on it are that well, they're both battle vessels. One's a battleship, one's a battle cruiser. They're both a battle. Whereas frigate is quite obviously not a battleship. Admittedly, the ironclad frigates had been the battleships of their era, but frigate is not a battleship. And you are almost bringing back the old sort of age of sail distinction. Generic person. I am reminded of the French Ducassine class. The amount of armor sacrificed to acquire a handful of knots more speed is really questionable after a point. As I've said before in other videos, there is a certain point at which it's law of diminishing returns. On the other hand, if the class had been built, the USN would have had the justification for a much larger fleet of fast oilers. That would have been great help to the whole fleet. As it was, the USN got two very big carriers that could have served viably till the early 1950s, barring war losses. So not entirely a wasted effort. Hmm... Imagine those two carriers with two battle cruisers of equivalent size, power, and efficiency to back them up, or even better, free and free. That would have been a very much better use of them. Bob Chicago, I've said it before, but I really dislike these ships. A Hawkins at close, not even close, uh, closer, not even close range, would create a significant problem for these ships, let alone a county or a Graf Spey. In a post dual environment, I do not understand the USN's choices. Sometimes I think they aren't paying any attention to anything that goes on the other side of the Atlantic, such as designing all their crews without hydrophones a la Agabaca, Cressy, and Hogue. And Norman Freeman proposed the USN officers saw the original Jutland report, the one that addressed to the cordite handling issues, as that could be the only explanation, uh, explanation for this level of lack of armour. DK Brown, not Freeman. Yes, it was DK Brown who suggested that, and I'm not sure I agree with him. I think it's the different in roles and their vision of what fighting in the Pacific is like. John Fisher, agree, six inches of armour is not proof against 11 or 12 inch shells, and the German shells were light compared to other nations. How can seven inches be proof against 15 or 16 inch shells, even if inclined? As someone said, what were you thinking? Knights of Clare Front, yeah, it would be, uh, it would be, and that is arguably why Hood's seven inch belt was to be removed in her planned reconstruction. Mm. It's, it's about roles, and it's what they're seeing these ships for. And you also have to perceive who they think their threat is. Do they think they're going to be using these vessels versus the Royal Navy? Seriously. The Royal Navy which has Hood, Renown, Repulse. When they're building these, they have Tiger and other for Queen Mary and... Not Queen Mary. They have Tiger and Lion. 13 and a half inch battleship, uh, battle cruisers going around. Plus a building the G3s. That's not a scenario you send these vessels into. These vessels are built for a war versus Japan. They're built with how they find out to find the Japanese fleet. They're, that's what they're built to. They're built to find the Japanese fleet and enable the sledgehammer of the battle line to find the Japanese fleet and decide when they're going to engage. Myself, I don't think it would necessarily work, but they're trying to avoid the fate of the, uh, the Russians at Tsushima, where the Japanese found the Russians, and the Japanese dictated the time and place of the engagement. 
because that's what the Americans had really drawn from Toshima that the Japanese if they can dictate time and place of engagement will set it up to suit them which is a big surprise La Fibre also say what you will about lexicons they are certainly far more pleasing eyed than their honoring counterparts to G3s uh, I would like to disagree, but I really hate where that turret is. Effective ships they may have been, but these things are some of the uh, th those things are some of the ugliest ships ever drawn up in history of mankind. I don't consider them the some of the ugliest I have seen other ships. Trust me, there are some French battleships which certainly. Let's put it this way: the the G threes are not even in the top five ugliest ships of all time. They they may make the top ten. Depends what happens to the place when I gun. As I've said, I've, I have a strong suspicion that the guns get shifted around a bit. On construction. And if you want a good example of that, I've done a video recently about Dante Alighieri. And she's a great example of, we start a building and we change things around. Fault to Lexington is probably Tillman Free. I doubt it. The problem is that Lexington aircraft carriers can do Lexington's job far better, than, uh, far better as can small cruisers. Can they in the 1920s? Think about the level of technology, think about the level of aircraft available, think about the level of communications and systems established and reliability of those aircraft. Can those aircraft do a better job than a Lexington over the ranges that's what they're talking about in the 1920s? That's, that's a scary thing to think about. Because often we are scrabbling to have an opinion on 1920s and 30s. We have an idea of how land-based aircraft and how effective they can be in reconnaissance roles in the World War One. We have an idea of how aircraft perform in World War Two. But we honestly don't have many documented examples outside of exercises, which are exercise conditions for 1920s and 30s, especially from the major powers. So we don't really know. You are perfectly right about 20 years later. But when does that transition happen? When does that change happen? At what point would the Lexington, draw, the Lexington shift from may, maybe being the primary reconnaissance asset to being the primary reconnaissance enabling asset that secures the carrier and allows it to go into areas where it could risk running into a Congo by giving something that can defend it. And again, people go, well, it would get beaten by a Congo. Well, Renown would get beaten by Latorios. She still goes and escorts Ark Royal, and when Ark Royal is in trouble and might get caught, Renown falls back. Her job is to buy time for Ark Royal to get away. That's what she will do. It's, that sounds like a terrible thing to say, but think about it. A cruiser or a destroyer falling back is not going to really stop the battleship coming on. This is part of the problem for Glorious when she sunk. She's got two destroyers as escort. There is nothing that can distract the attention of the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower. Nothing. But if Renown had been with her, well, A, they probably have avoided them, because let's be honest, Renown was all was spending most of her time whenever she saw those two chasing them, man manically going, I will hit you with my sword. Um, and this is a, this is from someone, who, by the way, who admits that they caused damage to Renown when she caused damage to them chasing them. But the fact is, that ship doesn't understand that Shanhorse and Eisenhower are in any way, shape, or form not there for her to beat up. Um, it's a small little complex Renown has. I, I like to believe all ships and crews develop, well, all warships and some merchant ships, thanks to this combination of their crews and the culture they create within themselves and sort of the atmosphere that's imbibes into a ship, have a personality. And War Spites is, there is action? Where is action? I'll go find it. Renown's is... You are now my target. I will hunt you down.
Rolstein, I think no treaty. The next generation Battlecruiser is easily a thousand foot long, 45 to 50,000 tons and 16 inch guns at a minimum in 18 inch and max. And I think you're, e you're easy guy, easily got nine guns in three turrets and or 18 to four. And I think you're talking 43 knots. There are N3 and G3s out there talking about 12 inch sloped armor in internal belt in a wartime crew, 1200 to 1500 men. You're probably not far off, but it depends Will the Americans be building their next generation to fight the G3s? Or will they be building them to continue on with the job that they want the Lexingtons to do? Cage Master, tell me you're looking up. Yes, I remembered about 20 minutes after upload, but I left it in instead of re recording as I thought it provided a point of discussion. And also because. I should probably try to be more of a. A present a perfect picture when I'm doing the videos but I try and do it an honest picture in that sometimes even with the amount of drafts and reshoots I do and the amount of editing there are still things which just haven't shown up right and I did have a version which I'd done earlier which had used cage masts but I didn't think it feel it felt with the flow of the version I was putting in. And I could have re-recorded something, but I thought, no, I'll leave it in. I'd admit it. Which is possibly not the most sensible thing to do, but it does also, as said, add in a point of conversation. Okay. So, David. Um, this is a lot of comments, and honestly... Well, at various points, you um, you say I run but do not answer. You um, let's see what else. So there's ah, you call me rude. Why? So just because I I as a biologist disagree with you, I never brought up the fact I'm a historian. I don't know you're a biologist, as I've said before. At the beginning, I have no idea who you are, David. I really don't, and honestly, I could. I have clicked on that afterwards to see if you had maybe you were you were a YouTuber and you did your own channels and they were on biology and therefore I should have possibly known because maybe you're a really popular YouTuber and biology YouTuber and I didn't realize in which case I'd have still answered the same way but you know hey ho um, but you aren't um, I'm not gonna click through to your channel. I'm not in that kind of business here But it's it's a case of you don't have biologist written anywhere on there and you don't have any videos up So I don't know how I was supposed to know you're a biologist. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't get an information pack every time someone's comments and you and I don't know each other. I Have never met you. I don't know you so I am commenting to you as a random person on the internet, I'm being polite. I'm always, I, I try to always be polite. Take people scholars seriously, but um, yes. And you have, well, yeah, I definitely didn't admit, uh, didn't say anything about that. Um, at no point have I called the Lexingtons oversized cruisers or super cruisers or anything like that. Um, CV Passum Parabellum has always been our motto. Before I get into my long written, I've written a response to you that I've said, because this is so long and so many different things. Uh, I, I'd just like to point out that actually it isn't. It hasn't always been the RN's motto. Um, it, it, it's important, but the Royal Navy actually gets its motto after the Royal Marines did. The Royal Marines got their motto in 1775, which is Permae Parterum. And. We know the Royal Navy, I even wrote it wrong site there myself, the Royal Navy had CV Passum Parabellum as a sort of motto, but not really recognised as an official motto before then. It's recognised really as an official motto actually after then, because they sort of go, well, hang on, we actually, the Royal Marines now have an official motto and we, we don't have one. Um, we have one we've been using for years, but we've never made it official. And even then, it doesn't trace back that far we it definitely doesn't trace back to the formation of the royal navy in 1546 um there is some theory it traces back to the early-ish 1700s there are some documents which are from the 1730s which talk about it being around earlier than that 
for about 20 years, but we can't find any documents earlier than that which say it, so... Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one, but no, I, I would love to claim that's always been the Royal Navy's motto, but it hasn't. Uh, there was many years when the Royal Navy didn't have a motto, or if it did, it wasn't that, and we don't really know what it was. Anyway, to get into your very, very spirited and passionate discussion about various things to do with the, the saints. Um, for starters, let's start off with saint names, because that's in there, and then I'll go into the Gleckson class versus the G3s. Saint names. I've done actually a little video about this on saint names, and it, the G3s are never considered for saint names, it's the N3s. Um, uh, but leaving that to one side, that this seems to be associated with, um, the all the evidence I've found so far has no source in the primary evidence, i.e. there's nothing where I found a document in the Admiralty. Now, admittedly, only 2% of documents survive from the National Archives of all the Admiralty documents ever, so there is a lot of space of things to be disappearing. But I haven't found either any personal accounts. Everything I've found rates back to historians referencing each other. And then the original historian describes it in their own words as a possibility mooted by Eric Gades, the first Lord of the Admiralty and the guy who's responsible for the Gades Axe. Considering Churchill had used to put forward names in that role that never got anywhere, Pitt, Cromwell, or whatever, and actually never even managed to get a class named um, with any of the suggestions, he's he, not even destroyers. Uh, the poor man, pretty much every single suggestion he ever put forward was turned down by the ship name committee. It almost became a running joke between him and Jellicoe um, in certain points of their discussions. Uh, while Jellicoe was at the Grand Fleet uh, during the beginning of the First World War, that even in wartime, Churchill couldn't get a name through the naming committee. So until the Naving Committee gives them, they don't have it. So any source, no matter who it is, who's claiming, and you said D.K. Brown, I, that's not really what I've read in his book, but I'm, I'm sure you, I, I, I trust your view. You know, if you've read that, you've read it. Um, as I've put there, I happen to be quite lucky. I, My dad knew D.K. Brown. They worked together and a few things. And... Um, Yeah, they argued on some things, agreed on others, but that gives me possibly a very different view of D.K. Brown than other people, because I have that in my, my history. And, well, even him, even his claims, which he doesn't actually give a source for, and in a section where I think it's relating to N freeze, um not g freeze are repeating what other historians have said. So, yeah, and all those historians, when you go back through the books, go back to this person saying, well, according to this person, this other person mooted this idea. That's... Let's put it this way, I always have criteria of what I will put in a book versus what I'll say on YouTube. And when I say on YouTube, I will say, I have one sketchy source for this. I'm sorry, but that sounds like the definition of one sketchy source. And that seemed, for, that seemed for, uh, to account the possibility that people could be getting it wrong and confusing as it goes through the lines. As for, you do at some point bring up Let the Saints Go Marching In. It's a gospel song which starts in the USA. I understand why you're you know, attracted to that idea, but um, there are different versions which are penned in 1896 and 1908, but it doesn't actually get popular in worldwide outside of the USA until roughly 19, late 1920s, and didn't come to Britain, it seems, till 1931. So, no, that song would have no impact on the Royal Navy's decision-making process. Saint names, as the Royal Navy put it, in World War One, when they were looking around for names for their monitors, were popery. And the admiral, one of the admirals who said that, and used that phrase, was a guy called Beatty, 
who at this point was first Sea Lord. So, yeah, whilst the <clears throat> first Lord of the Admiralty doesn't have much of an input on the ship naming committee, the first Sea Lord tends to have an impact. Um, third Sea Lord, who they, broadly speaking, sit under, tends to have quite a big impact. Um, and the particular third Sea Lord this time was even less keen on popery. And actually, that view has been quite a common thing for the Royal Navy, so much so that the most recent HMS St. George was an Edgar-class cruiser. And the rest hadn't been used since the 18th century. And this is leaving aside the biggest problem. If we go up to here, you have it, HMS St. David, St. Andrew, St. George, and St. Patrick. Well... Ireland had been fighting a war for independence from 1919, and it ended in July 1921. The G3s are ordered in October 1921. Uh, why would the Royal Navy be naming a vessel St. Patrick? They wouldn't be. So, yeah. Um, look, it's a very catchy idea, and there's a lot of mythology around it, but I've done a whole video about this, and I, so I don't want to get into too much detail, but frankly... There's nothing in there. As Knight6831 says, they were never, they were never officially named uh, later in the chat, so there's no point having an argument over it. Um, but honestly, no. And, yeah. It's just not happening. Saint names. It's a lovely thing, and so many sources do talk about it, but they're all repeating back to the same historian. And it's, it, it, it's one of those cool things. It sounds really cool until you go into it and start looking into the Royal Navy naming history and the Royal Navy nomenclature and the committees and what they do. And you realise that, yeah, it was going to be Admiral names. There is another reason I have a strong suspicion of Admiral names, because they were getting the name packs ready. And, and Rodney, well, we know where that name pack comes from because that name pack was actually attached to one of the Admiral class battle cruisers. So we know where that name come, pack comes from. But where does HMS Nelson come from? Now, please note, the pack was ready to go long before the Nelson-class battleship was ready to go. And the previous Nelson had been HMS Lord Nelson. Now, you don't change from Lord Nelson to Nelson as a name. Especially when you consider Lord Nelson was the name ship of the uh, the pre-Dreadnoughts, the Sovereign Star ships built at the same time as Dreadnought. You don't change from Lord Nelson to Nelson without a lot of committee meetings. Without committee meetings and minutes taking place at levels. And interesting enough, there are some discussions. Cute. That fits... Those discussions fit in time for the G3 class, not for the Nelson class, because they take place before the treaties, it seems. So, my strong suspicion is the G3s were going to be the Nelson class. My strong suspicion. And again, if you're the Royal Navy and you're going around the world... Nelson, Rodney, honestly not sure about Anson and how, but Nelson, Rodney, Anson and how, they're fairly good names to be putting out there. That's the G3s. My personal suspicion for the N3s is they were going to be Dreadnoughts. because of what they were being built as. The most heavily armoured, heavily armed battleships ever conceived. Dreadnoughts. But that's very much my two pennyworth, because on that one there is no clues. And this is why I refuse to accept anyone's suggestions for names of them. And I go, they don't exist. Because whilst I have a personal suspicion, based on Royal Navy naming history, 
I cannot prove that. I cannot even point to the things which give me the clues as to the Nelson class for the G3s. And even that, I cannot prove. That is, a, that is a personal suspicion. All I can do is say that the myth around the Satan names doesn't add up and doesn't fit with anything and doesn't have a good source behind it. It doesn't. I'm sorry. But it doesn't. As cool and as all the other things, it just doesn't fit. Now, the Lexings versus the G3s. This was something which you were very keen on because you seem to be... Well, you didn't comment this strongly on the G3 video, I think. But you did it on the Lexington class video. Okay, well, the Lexingtons and the G3s have different mission sets. That's the first thing you have to consider them. They're built for different oceans. They're built for different mission sets. This is something I, I get into a lot. Um, one of the things that you often have to consider about the Royal Navy is they are building a global navy. They're not building a navy for any particular ocean. They're building a navy for a particular type of fighting a war. So, for example, when we're talking about Ark Royal and the Illustrious class, right? Well, there's lots of people who like to go, well, that's the Mediterranean ship, that's the Far Eastern ship. Not really. Um, there is a reason why Ark Royal is more likely to be deployed to the Far East independently than the Illustrious class, but it's not because she's the Far Eastern ship. It's because, as she's built as a strike carrier, she's also built with the most hangar space. So she can do her own most uh, self-maintenance most easily. And if you're going to the Far East, you need to have that maintenance. Uh, the other ships considered for the role are the Implacables, which are also going to be the largest with the most hangar space. Ark Royal's the first choice for it, but yeah, the Implacable... Uh, that, but that's because the Implacables, when they come in, are going to be newer, and they prefer to keep them closer to home for home fleet duties because... They're going to be the new ships, the big ships. And to an extent, the beginning of the fusing of the fleet carrier and the strike carrier role. Because once you're clear of treaties, you no longer have to build one or the other. You can build You can build you can build the carrier you want. You can build the carrier you want. The British want a carrier which has the air group of an Ark Royal and the armoring of an Illustrious. That's what they want. The Illustrious class are fleet carriers. They are built to take damage and keep on fighting. That mean, that mean The reason that for that role is because they're the ones who are going to be closer to the battle line. The ones which are going to take damage. Now this can mean operating in the Far East. Where if they take damage, what happens? Well, if they take severe damage, they have to go all the way home to the UK. So anything which minimizes damage and means that they can be repaired in the forward facilities at Singapore, at Sydney, or Madras, or Bombay, and therefore be returned to the fight much more quickly, is an advantage. It's a very great advantage, logistically and force generation-wise. It also equates to the same. It's quite useful in other parts of the world. And again, if you're going to be... If you, those carriers, though, because they have the armor, have less space for maintenance spaces and supply spaces and hangar spaces because they have the weight associated with armor. So it's better to keep those deployed in areas in when they it's peacetime and you don't have to have them deployed in areas where they have access to more sustainment, i.e. the Mediterranean home fleets. So that makes sense of some of the pre-war plans, and that is actually what the pre-war planning is all about. So when someone says, oh, that was going to be the Far East carrier. That was built for the Far East. No, Ark Royal is built as a strike carrier, the one which will do the Alpha Punch to take over, uh, to support, well, really take over Furious, which have been being the third ship, and they're all along with Courageous and Glorious. And it, Furious wasn't really as good as, it, at, as the Courageous and Glorious for various reasons, including the way she'd been mangled during her, her various conversions. Now, those are the strike carriers. Then they're going to replace Courageous and, uh, Courageous and Glorious with the Implacables. Yay. Um, that's what they're doing. They're the strike carriers. They're supposed to give the big strike that's going to be able to do things like Taranto, and that's going to be over, able to overwhelm and crack any, heavy, any heavy enemy fleet defences. But the carriers which are going to be closer with the fleet, 
that are going to be closer to the battleships, that are going to be doing it like Formidable at Matapan. Remember, the amount of times I've talked about how Matapan is one of the, the only battle in World War II which goes exactly as a nation had prepared for it to go. Formidable isn't in her, the position in line by accident. That is where the fleet carriers were going to go during their movements to actions, etc. So they could provide the combat air patrol over the fleet. So that they could provide on the call strike and constant strike. So they could provide constant spotting for the battleships and reconnaissance. So they're supposed to be inbuilt into the fleet units, which is also a very dangerous position to be in. So they fit their roles. They fit the role envisaged for them. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily designed for one part of the world. There are parts of the world where they are probably more of a natural fit to the operating requirements there. But that is an accident of their design orientation, not the purpose of their design orientation. And it's very easy for people who are not involved to hear that. Now, one of the interesting things often quoted is D.K. Brown on that subject. But Stanley Goodall also writes on that subject. Stanley Goodall is the guy in charge of designing them. He is the director of naval construction at the same time as Henderson is third sea lord. He is designing the fleet. And what he says about the carriers, and remember, he's overseeing and in charge of designing them, is what I'm saying. D.K. Brown is someone who spends quite a large part of his life arguing with Goodall and telling everyone that Goodall made mistakes and trying to point out errors in Goodall made and all sorts of things. Um, they did not... I'm not sure if they had a good personal or professional relationship when they worked together, but certainly after Goodall had died and D.K. Brown is writing his books, he never knowingly misses an opportunity, it seems, to point out the failings of his senior. I have no idea why, but if you go through his books, it does seem to be a common recurring thing. I know Goodall wasn't always the easiest person to get on with. I've looked at the book, enough books and enough stuff to see that. And there were lots of people who felt he didn't promote them when they should have been. Goodall tended to be someone who, if he felt someone was very good in a spot, especially during World War II, if they were good in it and it was running well, he wouldn't move them around. He'd leave them there. When they wanted to go higher and get onto another role, but he could trust them in the role they were in. Doesn't always create joy, no happiness. Now let's get back to the Lexingtons versus the battle uh, versus the G threes. Just like British carriers are orientated around different missions, uh, mission perceptions than uh, each other in terms of the armed carriers, and then you can go to the American carriers and the Japanese carriers, who of course have the other benefit in their design lexicon that they are actually being built to fight in the oceans where their infrastructure is based. The Japanese are, of course, entirely in the Pacific, and that's where they're aiming to fight. The Americans have an entire coastal in the Pacific. It's far different from having to sail all the way around the world to get to your major infrastructure bases. You can build them where you actually are. It's brilliant, and it makes a difference in your ship design. Well, it's the same with Lexington's versus G3s. The G3s are built to be Britain's distant station battle cruisers. They are going to be the ones operating, providing the core of what would be in the Eastern Fleet. I... Jellicoe wants a, bal a free balance fleet, so that wasn't going to happen. But I have a feeling the Lexingtons would have formed the, uh, the G3s would have formed the bases of the British Far Eastern Fleet. Probably based on the Salon, maybe Madras, that sort of area. And orient operating between, uh, you know, forward bases, Way Highway, Singapore, those sort of things, wandering around. That was their role. And they were going to secure that area and protect that area and be the pre major presence of the area. Everything else may be turning up occasionally, but mainly that they would lead it. Because again, they're being built with the infrastructure that's out there in mind. They're being built with long-term deployments in mind. That's what they're built for. So the G3s are battle cruisers oriented around the destruction of surface raiders, economic warfare and presence mission. The Lexingtons, in contrast, are oriented around the role of reconnaissance and economic warfare. Also to exempt hoovering up cruisers. Hoovering up cruisers. But whereas the G3s are oriented around hoovering up cruisers and battle cruisers, they will hoover up both. There is a difference there. 
But that's also because the Lexingtons are expecting a battle fleet to be operating not far away from them, so they can always fall back on that. So you can orientate them around the missions they need to do, whilst not needing to worry about the mission about fighting other battle crews, etc., because they're always supposed to be able to fall back on the battle fleet, the big heavy sledgehammer, the, you know, the South Dakotas, etc., coming up. Now, that's their wartime role, but what also matters is their peacetime role, and that's, of course, presence mission. Now, at this point, David, you seem to focus in on how they look sitting next to each other. Well, it's a nuanced thing, because Lexington probably lit up better, because she's going to have a lot of electric lighting, like American ships often did, especially at night. But the G3 would look more unusual. However, the scenario of them actually ending up next to each other in any port is going to be very rare, if not non-existent. Why? Because... Your appearance, you, you appear from your statements and comments to believe that the Royal Navy is going to chase Lexington around from port to port with G3. So basically every time a Lexington turns up, a G3 is going to turn up or there or something after. The, that kind of chasing scenario, that's not the mark of a major power. That makes you look like the weaker power. That makes you look like you're chasing them. If the RA were worried about a port visit, if they were worried about a port visit, let's be honest, but Lexington's going to visit Japan. Uh, the RN worried that's going to have a big impact on American-Japanese relationships that, you know, they need to be there for? No, because honestly, as a rule, the Americans are more likely to put their foots in it in the 1920s and 30s. So there's no reason the Royal Navy's going to worry about that one. Uh, let's see, they visit China? Mm, that's not really much of a problem either. Um, they visit Australia? Well, Australia's called the Royal Australian Navy. It has an impact. Uh, same with Canada. Um, what about South America? Well, that's not going to be the G3's operational area, and the Royal Navy has cruisers wandering around there on a regular basis. And that's where the things come in. If they, if the are worried about a port visit and its potential impact, they'd have three options. If they regularly visit that place, they'd probably continue as normal. Probably. After all, um, the what better way of showing up a uh, another's capital ship? Then by trumping it with a cruiser, I, the station flagship turns up and the Admiral hosts everyone to dinner on his cruiser or something like that, uh, just as they normally do. Oh, we were, maybe we turn up a bit early, you know, do it while the Americans are in and just trump them there, or um, turn up afterwards. Doesn't really matter, it's when we regularly come, it's nothing special. It's an ongoing relationship. They turn up, they look back, yeah, that's lovely. And when was the last time they visited? Oh, it's such a special occasion when they turn up. You can hear the phraseology now as it drips into people's mind. It's dripped into conversation. If they don't regularly visit the place, they'll look to see what is close enough to get there first. This is if it's important enough for them to visit and actually worry about. Whatever largest ship is closest will be sent. The criteria is it has to get there first. The Americans have to look like they are chasing them. They are following them into port. They are behind them. Oh, you finally turned up, did you? How cute. The third option is ignore it completely. Visit another port nearby, preferably one that will cause ructions because they're visiting that one rather than the one the Americans visited. It's all fun and games. Now, I hope that answers your questions and the various comments. I will say... It was a long discussion. On the day of the coronation, Michael Cav wrote, a uh, great battle cruiser design that turns out to be somewhat less than ideal hull form for a carrier. It was okay. British Emperor, points to free. Do you really want to push it? Hey, at least Lexington's look past, uh, look pleasing to the eye. Uh, John Fisher left him. I actually like the look of the G3s. I can imagine last Lexington's would have gone if they completed with, uh, completed with seven funnels. <laughs> yeah. 1040. Jock, just stop an imita imitation of American agorists, as it does not suit you, as that is an impression I'm getting. It's not arrogance, it's the psychology imagery of the presence, and it's as much part of the Lexington class design as it's a tribal class. 
it, you've got to imagine what uh, what image they are trying to perceive, or rather, make be, uh, people perceive. Remember, you don't control what people perceive; you control what you project. That's how you shape someone's perception of you. What you project towards them. A febrile. Sadly, playing the constellation in World of Warships is the closest we will get to see, uh, seeing the real for, uh, thing for now. Russell, how does it play? Curious, I play on Legends, the console version. We don't have the ship yet. Um, fast, hits hard, but really fragile. That's how it's somewhere up. Robertson, is the HP decent? Sounds like a really good edge of the map sniper with 16 inch guns. Going to have to use Cunningham as an inspiration and get that accuracy up so you can pop a Cleveland broadside on the other side of the map. La Freeville, love an era of her tier 8 counterparts, the North Carolinas and the Kansas. Robertson, Kansas is a tank in Legends. Version, lol. Right on, thank you for the info. Hopefully, you get the ship soon. Even if it's not that good a ship, I still want it for my collection. Kind of like Mikasa, they need to make a more tier 1 and tier 2 pre dreadnoughts. I think that would make one tier one and tier two more fun. Hmm. Lovely roll. Kansas is pretty tanky in the PC version as well, unsurprising. Nice area here everyone. Peace and love from the country who in 1924 would ban Japanese people from moving to the United States and would throw Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Yeah, so much for love and peace. Um, look, I will say this. Again. Politicians sometimes make the worst diplomats because... They honestly believe their own hype, and they honestly believe they can sometimes say one thing domestically and another thing foreignly in foreign policy, mm -hmm. and that the two will not connect. They do. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, because well, even the Pagoda Mouse, my infiltration mission is, is meeting an unexpected time traveling ocean, hopping success. Doubtless, this is part of Perfidious Alvin's evil plan to set Japan and America at each other's throats so Canada can get finally liberated by Florida. <laughs> mm. Anyway, that's it. Um. So, I hope you enjoyed all that. Um, that. It's interesting to me which ones in the Keyship series have attracted the most comments. And have attracted the most discussion. It's not necessarily been the ones I thought it would. There's some I, I, I've been pretty accurate as to which would uh, attract it and which wouldn't. But others, I've been completely caught out because they haven't attracted any comments. Or they've attracted tons of them and I've just gone, wow. Anyway, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, thank you for commenting, and, um, yeah, I'm probably going to do the same thing with all the key ships and key aircraft and all the, the key ship and key aircraft series, which are going to be next year. I'm probably going to be uh, saving them up, them up for the end of the year discussions, although I have to admit, I might start recording the comment response videos earlier in the year, although... In a delicious twist of fate, I have to say this was delicious. I literally finished recording, uploaded, and set it for one of them, and someone commented something actually quite rude, but commented quite, uh, you know, commented, and just went, I'm not opening it up again for you. I'm just not. I'm on a satellite internet link. I am not opening it up for you. It is. It takes longer to upload than it does to record and edit. I am not doing this. Thank you. Better go find out what's going on.